Hi, this is Pat Love from Love Healing Hearts, here to talk to you about the difference from different perspectives of how we see God. Listen to this. Starting at 1 Peter chapter 2, and we are going to read verse 7 and 8, just right there. I'm trying to decide if I should read verse 2. Yeah, let's go to verse 2 real quick. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. There it is. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Okay. Now, we're going to go down to verse 7 and 8. Listen to this. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. There's a, a, an anchoring place right there and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. Now listen, I, I want to stop right there for a moment, because I want to share something. When you, if somebody hands you a crutch, and you're having a bad time because you're healing, your leg has been damaged, whatever, you are welcoming that crutch because you know that crutch is going to help your mobility. You also welcome the cast that they put on your leg because you know that's going to protect the injury from getting any more damage done. Am I correct? So that is what the Bible means when it says, to us who believe, he is precious. He is a chief cornerstone. Okay, now, and no matter what, because we believe in him, we won't be overwhelmed, we won't be thrown, we won't be confounded. But when we are depending on God, and he is our anchor, and he is our foundation, and he is the, the main, he is the one that holds us up, that keeps us together, the chief cornerstone. Okay, chief cornerstone of a building, two walls, cornerstone, first, first stone before they lay the rest to build up that wall. This is what I'm saying. When you do not believe, listen to this. This is how you know where you are in the Lord. Number one, you don't feel comfortable around God's people. You start becoming critical of them. Just their very presence for you is an annoyance. Oh yeah, that's a true sign that you are on dangerous territory unless you've already slipped all the way off. Okay, here's another one. You feel guilty and condemned. You assume they're talking about you and judging you, even if they don't have a clue. There's another scripture that says, because... Okay, I'm trying to get it straight. The wicked flee where no man pursue. That's just another way of saying you're paranoid. Everybody's watching you. Everybody knows your business. No, they don't know, but you know. And that's why you're on edge when you get around people who are trying to live a holy life. They get on your last nerve and everything that has to do with Jesus does as well. And in your mind, it doesn't take all that. In your mind, they're just overboard. It's, you know, that's why them people get on my nerves. And you were once one of them. What happened? Think about that. What happened to you? Okay, listen to this. And a, this is verse 8. I'm reading it this again. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Mm. You know, you know how kids get angry? They get annoyed. They get bothered if the parent catches them doing something. 
they're either going to get annoyed or they're going to be afraid and uncomfortable. Okay. Now, when you look at stuff like that, the only people who get bothered or get paranoid or afraid are people who have something to hide. You remember the story about Adam and Eve in Genesis? And you remember how when uh, they ate of the fruit and they they uh, yielded to the, the, the sinful nature where Satan had tempted them to eat the fruit from the tree, from the garden, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Now, they only knew good. But now they also knew evil. And what was the first thing they did? Check it out. Check it out. What was the first thing they did? You tell me. Can you think of it? The first thing they did was hide from God. Did they not? And the second thing they did was try to cover up. And what did they tell God when he said what happened? And they said, well, we were running from you because we, we knew we were naked and we were ashamed. And what did God ask them? Who told you you were naked? You know, have you ever been caught with your hand in the cookie jar or, or you try to take something that doesn't belong to you or in an untimely manner and they told you not to, they told you to leave it alone. Well, if some saint walks up to you while you're sneaking your can of beer in the shopping cart. You're trying to cover it up so they don't see it. Listen, what does that come from? You don't like the feeling of being caught. Because you know what you're doing you should not do. You know it inside. So what do you do? You get annoyed at the person, at the righteous person. Who catches you? Whether they know that you hit something or not, you assume they know. So you're afraid and you're ashamed. And what do you want to do? Cover it up. That's what comes from condemnation. That's what comes when you know you're wrong. Don't, see, these are the little subtle signs. They say it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Not the big ones, the little ones. I'm a little chilly, so I'm bundling up here, waiting for the for the uh, the optimum time to turn on my gas, so the gas bill won't be so high. But anyway, just in case you're wondering why I'm all bundled, but listen to this: when you know you're wrong, you don't want to hear it. When you don't want to do it right and get it together, you don't want anybody getting in your business. You don't want to be accountable. You don't want to be bothered. You don't want to be caught. Think about that now. It's not that you don't care what they think. Is that you want to do what you want to do. And you don't want anybody making you accountable for your actions. So rather than have to be accountable for your actions, what do you do? You avoid the saints. Totally. That's the rock of offense. That's when Jesus becomes a rock of offense because his very presence, the presence of his people, the presence of his righteousness, his word is annoying because it's raining on your parade. You know what you want to do. Let me tell you something. Um, Someone that I knew very closely way back before I married my second husband, who is now my late husband. Um, I'll just go on and say it. My first husband was, uh, we were married eight years. And the only reason I divorced him, because we got along fine, was his adultery. And he committed adultery starting the second month of our marriage. And God had already given me a dream about that. Do you hear me? Now, what I noticed is when he was doing well spiritually, oh, we could sing the praises of God together and harmonize and we would play handball and go ride the bikes, go swimming. We'd have all kind of fun. 
But when he was doing wrong, he would look at me out the corner of his eye. And I would tell him, God already told me what you did. You know, it was, I don't know how to say this, but there is a level. When, when the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, there's a tail end to that sentence that ties it all in together and makes sense. Who walk not after the flesh. It's not just them who are in Christ Jesus. You hear me? It's also who walk not after the flesh. When he started walking after the flesh, condemnation was all over his countenance. He would look at you as if to say, you caught me. You're talking about me behind my back. He was also, I mean, the whole look was different. It was the most bizarre thing. And I wouldn't even be angry with him. God had handled me. I'm telling you, God worked miracles in me in that situation. With levels of forgiveness, love, acceptance, the whole nine yards. By the third year, I had so released it. The, I mean, with God's help, I had asked God to help me do so. I had so released that whole problem that I could come home and already know that he had just come out from the sheets of a prostitute. And I'd ask him what he wanted for dinner or did he want to go to the movies or it was just it was I was just at the point where I was totally disengaged. I was still a married woman and I was faithful to him, but I was disengaged. Now, I was comfortable around the saints. Listen to this. I was comfortable going to church in my own, in myself. I didn't feel too hot about uh, my ex-husband not coming with me. That made me feel kind of weird, but I was comfortable going. I was comfortable being around the people of God, hearing the word and all that, because I had nothing to hide. On the other hand, when he was doing poorly, was when he would stop going. He would find all kind of excuses or just not say anything and not get dressed. Now, when he was trying, he would stand up and tell the whole congregation what he was doing and what his struggle was. He even told me. But when he didn't want to try, he wouldn't want to go to church. And he didn't want to be around the saints. I mean, he wasn't mad at him, but he was so condemned and bound and ashamed and self-conscious and all that came from his own sins. I'm telling you, you guys, you know you're in dangerous, on dangerous turf when you start feeling those feelings, when you start hiding it and people find things in the trash because you were able to play with it and then get rid of it real quick so Nobody would catch you in the act. I would walk in the bedroom sometimes, open the door, and the cover would be boom, 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 boom. And I'm looking at him like, wow. And he would look at me and say, Patty, you know, it's like you walked in on me naked. He wasn't naked. He was covered up. But he was ashamed. Do you hear what I'm saying? I wasn't condemning him. Didn't make me feel too pretty as a woman. But I wasn't condemning him. God had given me an understanding that he was working out of an emotional thing that had happened that he probably didn't even deal with. And it really caused some unbalanced stuff. He was a very, very good person. I'm not bashing him. What I'm trying to tell you is what the flesh does to you. This, that's what the flesh does. Anyway, I'm just saying that so you can take your temperature and you can see where you are with God. Are you in, on good terms or are you skating on thin ice? Because you will act just like Adam and Eve. Avoid God 
and cover yourself up. And see, God sees our nakedness. And when I say nakedness, I'm talking figuratively. You can go to God. This is how, listen, this is how understanding God is. You can go to God. I've done it. You can tell him, I don't like so-and-so. And I know you want us to love those that aren't that lovely or easy to love. So I'm asking you to give me some more love. Now, he's okay with that. Because we're going to him. We're going to the source. He knows we can't do all this on our own. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. But there are times, because we are an earthen vessel, we leak. And we have to go back for new and fillings. (laughs) Like a car has to get filled up with gas in order to keep running correctly. Well... And we need the oil for our car, for the engine to run smoothly. Well, folks, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that our lives will have as little bumps, kinks, and knocks as possible. And listen, when God sees you trying, you can tell God the ugliest things that are in your heart. You can tell God when you're angry at him. You can tell God when you feel like you just want to give up and throw in the towel and how disgusted you are and everything else. But guess what? You're talking to the right person because all you have to do is say, Lord, make an adjustment in my attitude because I'm not faring too well in through here. Well, he knows it. But he is so happy that you came to him, that you didn't turn to the weak and beggarly elements of sin and nonsense and and, and your old ways and your old patterns and old comfort zones rather than going to him. He'd much rather you go to him with the filthiest side of your personality, with your filthiest weaknesses, sins, besetting sins, hindrances, obstacles, emotional hangups, emotional scars. Because he knows he can fix you, but you cannot fix yourself. A bottle of beer won't do it, a cigarette. I definitely won't do it. A good lay in the hay won't even touch it. And God knows that more than you. But every once in a while, we go back to, to some of that old stuff, don't we? Because mm. we want an instant high. We want an instant response. And sometimes God wants you to suffer through some things. Because what happens when you suffer through is he can skim the scum. Just like you do when you're cooking meat, you're boiling meat, you let it boil it a while, tongue, uh, certain types of meat. You let it boil and you skim off that scum and you pour out the initial water and pour fresh water in it and reboil it. That's when you pour in your seasoning. Because you're getting rid of all the contaminants and all the all the soot and the, and the junk and the f- extra fat and all that nonsense and all those oils. You know, that is what God does with us. Let him clean you. Don't run from him when you're falling away. Don't run from him when you're tripping over your own feet and getting tempted and wanting, wanting to be drawn away of your own flesh so you can enjoy it for a minute. Run to him, tell him, and ask him for your help. I guarantee you, God will not fail you if you really want the help. You'll get it. Got to really want it. Anyway, God bless you. Be encouraged. You hear me? And remember, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God bless you. Amen.